You're listening to Halfway There, episode number 197, Julie Hamilton and Trusting Over Pleasing. Hey friends, welcome to Halfway There. This is the show where we have honest conversations with ordinary Christians about today's Christian experience. I'm your host, Eric Nevins, of course. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, I'm super excited to share this conversation with you. As always, we talk about the spiritual journey. Um, If you haven't gone out to Halfway There podcast to check it out, I'd love it if you did that. We have a Facebook page. Did you know that? You can always like us on Facebook, keep in touch. I'm, I'm often posting things like, older episodes that you might have missed or questions over there that we can have a conversation. And I'd love to have you be in that conversation. So uh, join us. I'd love that. Um, That's just facebook.com slash halfway there podcast, I believe. So check that out. Or you can just, again, uh, halfway there podcast.com. You can find it there. Uh, Friends, our guest today, I can't wait to uh, talk with her. Got a chance to meet her in person a couple of, well, it feels like forever ago because... (laughs) It does. Every day, every day is a lifetime at this point, but uh, at the Spark Podcasting Conference, um, she's a faith-based podcaster, speaker. Um, she's a radio and TV co-host. I want to hear about that. And I love this. She calls herself an encourager. So I'm sure we'll hear about that. She's a mom and a, a wife and also doing a whole bunch of other cool things. So she'll share it with us. Our guest today is Julie Hamilton. Julie, welcome to Halfway There. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you today. It's exciting. This is the most exciting thing I've done all day. <laughs> well, excellent. That's good. I mean, in the middle of a quarantine when everybody's home, I'm not sure if that's as big a compliment as I'd like it to be. <laughs> I'm like, I have an appointment today at 12 o'clock, you guys. <laughs> Gotta go. Right. I know. It's, uh, it's been really, really strange. How are you and your family holding up throughout all of it? You know, it's been, I would say, a roller, a little bit of a roller coaster. Our, so for our, we're small business owners and we've lost all of our second quarter income. But I got to tell you, I am praising the Lord because he's been putting in our hearts for the last few years to have between six and 12 months of income saved. And um, we had a very successful business. But uh, when you take groups of pictures, uh, you take pictures of groups of people um, and you're in a quarantine, it's like a bad situation, right? (laughs) You know, Um, so but, you know, I'm really blessed to be able to have food on our table and to it's really been in some ways exciting also to be able to eat dinner with my family around the table. I have two teenagers, their sports and music and church and, you know, all the commitments. And I've really enjoyed eating dinner around the table and having these like kind of commitment free nights. So there's been some beautiful things about it, but I think everybody's doing pretty good overall. Great. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, definitely. That's, the mo- I think for me, the most interesting aspect is how is the economy going to rebound from this? And will yeah. more people be working from home, um, whether they're in corporate jobs or not? And will will more people actually they've got time to work on their projects, the things that they always thought they might do someday? Yeah. Maybe they'll be starting them now. Also, I'd like to welcome all of the churches out there to the party. So the the Facebook Live and all those things. <laughs> right. <laughs> All those things you didn't have time for before that I've been doing for you and probably too for several years. Uh, They're all on board now. I think that's hilarious. So it's good. (laughs) It's pretty great. But I was saying to my friend today, one of the things that is really interesting about this time period is also seeing that kind of the the earth and nature is getting a little break. I, I, I keep seeing these stories about like, wildlife and fish and stuff coming back to areas where they weren't and then like blue skies over los angeles for three weeks <laughs> like you know it's you have to see the air that you breathe in there i mean that's incredible yes i think as believers um we absolutely have a responsibility to take on or to take care of the earth and this is just kind of a wake-up call maybe about that yeah and uh so i hope i hope we'll commit to more sustainable things in the future and maybe somebody's inventing like something like a uh a solar shingle you know like i think every house should have solar oh. shingles right somebody should invent that right now i know elon musk was working on it hasn't happened yet anyway interesting um yeah stuff like that right maybe maybe we'll have that 
Um, that's so cool. Well, all right. So I want to he- hear about you and your story. You mentioned that you're a business owner, but uh, and maybe that's what you want to say. But is there anything else you want to tell us kind of about you right now and kind of where God has you? Oh, about me and my life? Yeah. Wow. God's brought me in a total transformation in the last less than two years, probably 18 months. Um, He has sort of rebuilt my entire life. So I was a homeschooling mom for 14 years. And so um, business owner, I was a teacher before that. And um, at the end of 2018, I sort of had this moment. We had gone through a lot of really hard things. We live in, in Northern California. So we've had a big earthquake, a couple mm. of fire seasons that were devastating yeah. our friends' homes and everything, gone through a few things. And, you know, I was reading the book Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. Have you ever read that book? No. Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. And all of a sudden, I realized at the end of 2018, God asked me, would you give me the last 120 days of 2018? And, you know, before that, my life was just kind of simmering. Like I was always boiling underneath, sort of just simmering with intense emotion and stuff. And and God really sort of in that 120 days took me, spent a lot of time in the end of John between Peter's betrayal and the balcony moment, which was 120 days. And that process that Peter went through where God was actually breaking him down to build him up into the what he's actually called him to be and so in that 120 days my life got broken down to the foundations i i went on a trip um to europe for my 20th anniversary i came back i could not do anything that i had been doing before i'd been doing all the podcasts all the videos all the posting all the stuff you know and i just couldn't do it anymore and I let God strip me down to my foundations. It was very humbling. It was very painful. Um, Acknowledging that there were some things that I hadn't dealt with, some grief, some loss, some ministry loss, some church hurts, Mm. some marriage hurts, all this stuff that I hadn't dealt with. I'd just been like cramming it down and being like, yeah, we're happy. We're good, you know, and, and just, you know, going on in that, which I believe is the, the Lord wants to offer us hope. But I believe sometimes if we're not dealing with the things that are in our plates or in our lives, we can have be offering sort of this false sense of, of a very trite um, way of saying like everything should be great. And sometimes it's not great and yeah. that's okay. So um, I just felt the Lord stripped me down to my foundations and it was very painful. And he told me, I am, I am stripping you down to your foundations because you're going to need a strong foundation for where I'm taking you next. And I had no idea where that was because I'm just a homeschooling mom, you yeah. know, and working at home with our business. And so, um, but I let him do that. And over the next six months, I would say like in the first six months of 2019, during that period of time at the end of 2018, I felt the Lord speak to me it's time to go to the next level. You're either going to be involved in getting your master's degree or be involved in politics or public office. Oh, wow. And I immediately started researching all the master's degrees programs, you know, because I hate politics, (laughs) right? I'm I'm a number nine on the Enneagram. I'm not about like conflict, you know, and like when I was looking at politics, I was just seeing it as people fighting, you know, and being mean to each other. Right. And, but, as I went through this process, you know, God really started showing me that it's actually about God using his leaders to create good governance for people and that he can actually use us as Christians to love our brothers and sisters by creating laws and systems and and uh, governments that, that help and protect and love them. And so lo and behold, I had no idea this was going to happen, but lo and behold, um, last summer, the person who's now the vice mayor of our city reached out to me. Uh, I had had her on the podcast. I had heard her story, invited her on the podcast. And she said, uh, you know, God had been preparing me all that time because I'd been thinking, like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing these live videos? Why am I doing this podcast? And she reached out to me and she said, I'd love to see if you could come help me host my radio show and help me host my TV show and find all the guests for those. Oh, and wow. 
Right. And I almost said no. I was going to say no because I was like, <laughs> I can't do that. Then God is like, I've been preparing you for this for yes. five years. And um, it was, you know, you know how it is as a podcast host. You're finding your guest and you're in literally, I said yes. And literally, I do the same thing, but for a much larger audience in a much further reach and a much more frequent. And so, um, it's been a really, really interesting and fascinating um, journey to be with with her and to be getting a very inside glimpse of the way that government and cities and all of that work. She's running for mayor, Doris Gentry. Um, she's running for mayor this year. And so I got to become the marketing and media director for the campaign. Wow. And so... It's like, yeah, I find I like I'm just a homeschooling mom. This is not my world, you know, yeah. and but God's just really sort of put me on the fast track to this whole world that I knew nothing about. And it's been quite fun and amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's given you some skills. You're so right. Podcasting is like you're the producer. You're the talent. Yes. <laughs> you're the marketing like you're, you do everything. Yeah, yeah, totally. Front to back. Totally. Oh, very cool. That's a great story. Let's go way back. So, are you from? You said you're in Northern California. Are you from there? You grew up there? No, oh, I am okay. from Texas. You're from so, Texas. All right. <laughs> I'm from Texas. So I moved around. I went to ten different schools before I graduated high school, and so I grew up in a Christian home. And uh, and one thing I love is that both of my parents were actually children of alcoholics. And they both decided they became Christians and they decided to give us a very different life than they had had. And I think that's I, I really admire and appreciate that first generation person that really takes a stand in their lives. You know, in my my life, my husband is that first generation person that has really stood up against all that's coming down the family line and saying, hey, I want to do something different for my family. And um, it just has made all the difference in my life, in my siblings' lives, that we didn't grow up in the same kind of home that my parents did. Wow. So we were raised in a Christian home. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, that's great. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. Okay, so you grew up in a Christian home. So you went went to church. Did you ever have like a personal moment? How did your faith become your own? It, it so, sounds like you went to church oh. and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. And you know, what's funny is we went back and forth between the Baptist church and the charismatic church. Oh, nice. So I don't know how we got those two ends going on, you know, when I was growing up, but what happened, what really turned my life around because you can grow up in church, but not have the church in you. And so I love God and in a religious sort of way, I, I would call it sort of religious. Like I did all the things I was supposed to do. When I was in high school, I was involved with a group of kids at our, they were in leadership at our church. And unfortunately we were all not making some good decisions and not the kind of decisions that you would want your leaders to be making. So I was um, gonna be a senior in high school and my dad's company said, hey, we want you to move to California for nine months. And I was like, you know, we were like, what? That's crazy. You know, we, like California was like, might as well be like the moon, yeah. you know, from, from where I grew up. Are, are you Were you like me? So I grew up in Iowa. Yeah. And there were two places, three places that were really exotic, right? Colorado, California, and Hawaii. Right. Yes, totally. <laughs> and now I live in Colorado. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. It's like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I right. know. No, it's so true. Like California just might be as well as far away as anywhere in the universe, you know, right, like yeah. I never. So I was like, well, you know what? Uh, I, so I knew I didn't like where I was. I, I mean, I liked the people, but I didn't like where I was in my own walk where I was making decisions that were running against my integrity and running against what I felt in my heart I should be doing. But I, I kind of felt trapped in that. Um, I didn't know how to get out of it. So I said to myself, you know what, Julie, why don't you go to California? You can see the Golden Gate Bridge and you can go to Disneyland and you'll come home. And so, you know, like that's the two things that you do in California, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so I, I don't know about you, cause I want to ask you this question, but like my friends, this is totally not relevant to the podcast, but my friends would always tell me when I, when they said I was moving to California, they would say stuff like, um, well, you know, there's no dress code there. So people wear their <laughs> bathing suits and their flip flops to school. <laughs> and I thought everybody could surf. And, yeah, right, you know, right. I just had these, you know, what did you think about like Cal Colorado or California? Oh, man. Well, California, all I knew was what the Beach Boys told me. Right. So yeah. 
Yeah, that was pretty much or <laughs> or the Disney Channel. So yes, it was. I guess it was in Florida, but. For me, seeing having watched so many years of the Disney Channel, when I went to Epcot and I saw the big giant golf ball, it was a spiritual experience, you know, <laughs> because it was like this is so huge, such a big part of my my childhood. Oh, I uh, hate it. It was amazing, right? So yeah, it's funny how that works as a, as a kid. You think, oh, and then it's kind of when then when you go there as an adult, you're like, oh, it's just like every place else. But right, like overpriced. I mean, I love Disney, right. but last time I went there, I was like, oh, as the parent, it's not nearly as much fun as the kids. It's not as cool. Yeah, all right. It's like Christmas, right? You're just doing it yeah. for the kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so when I got here, you know, people would ask me questions like, well, did you guys ride horses to school? Um, you know, I love that. I mean, like, it was so funny how we all have stereotypes about each other. But so anyway, when I moved here, something really cool happened. And it was that I went to a church here in town and I met these kids and so I was 17. So they, they love the Lord and they were actually making the choices that showed that they love the Lord in their life. And it was like, it inspired me. It ignited me. And I was like, wow, these kids really love God. And it did something in me that that hadn't been done before. So it really set me on the path to go like, this is what I want to do. You know, this is how I want to live my life and how I want to show the Lord that I love him. And, you know, I think as an adult, now I'm walking out learning, like there's a difference between pleasing and trusting God. And sometimes we work so hard on pleasing God and doing all the right things that we forget Mm. that it's really about trusting him with everything instead of just always working to please him. So I'm, I'm, you know, working out that, but, um, but God did use it in my life. And, you know, the funny thing is that was in 1992. So, uh, I graduated in 1993, but it's like 2020 and I still live here. So, you know, go figure. (laughs) You never left. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I lived in New Mexico for a while. I lived in LA for 15 years. I went, lived in Costa Rica for a while and I came back. So there gotcha. you go. There you go. Well, very interesting. So, yeah, it sounds like what you found is you really needed uh, some people who would show you what life in Christ was like yes. or could be. And it sounds like you yes. found kind of a, a crowd who could do that for you. Yeah. And that inspired you. God used that to kind of draw you into him in a way. Yes, for sure. And it just when you're I think when you're around people that are doing that, it just ignites something in you that goes, yeah, because, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, when you, when you're making choices that don't really line up with who you are and what you really want to be doing, there's such a a tension in that. Mm -hmm. And it's so uncomfortable. And then when you finally get to that place where you just kind of get at peace with yourself, where you're like, yeah, this is what I'm meant to be and and what I'm meant to do and who I'm meant to be. Have you had that experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like going from that sort of misalignment to like, oh, yeah, this is right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a longer story than I, we have time for. So <laughs> uh, very good. Well, that that's certainly interesting. Okay. So how did that faith, sounds like your friend group there was probably a big part of it. How did your faith sort of take root? And, you know, usually in that season you're learning. So I don't know whether like passages or studies or people who invested in you that were really instrumental for you in, as you grew your faith during that season or yeah. Shortly after. I'd probably say my mentor, um, B. Tapper. I ended up living with her when I was in college. My family moved away and I lived with her. And um, she was a great spiritual mentor to me. But I would say more of my faith developed. We ended up moving down to L.A. And I think more of my faith developed there because went through some real difficult times. And, you know, when I was my daughter, who's 19 right now, when she was very, very little, I went through a severe time of really, really bad anxiety. Um, I had a lifetime diagnosis of panic disorder, uh, was given that, and I couldn't even go out of my house. Um, I was so riddled with anxiety. And I would say that's really where the Lord started talking to me about scripture. I mean, he talked to me about scripture all along the way. But when I was thinking, like, what's one scripture that really transformed my life? And... It was at that time and the, I put up the, I posted this verse on my mirror in my room 
And it was the verse that said, though my heart and flesh may fail, Mm. the Lord is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Mm. And it really meant a lot to me because, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking like there was many times where I knew like, Oh, I, I'm, I got to take my little toddler to the playground, you know, to go play at the park. And I would be just in hysterics and tears, having panic attacks about going to the park. Or um, one time I remember my husband said to me, oh, come look at the moon. It's so beautiful. And like inside, I just I really wanted to do that. But I remember walking and it was nighttime, clearly, because we were looking at the moon. But walking on the driveway, it was like I just felt like almost like I had claws, like gripping the driveway with every Mm. step. And so I knew that reality that my flesh was failing me. My body was not doing what I wanted it to do. And my flesh really failed. And I think that's the point where I really had to lean on scripture to grasp like what's really true in this situation. Like the truth is God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And my body might not be cooperating right now. It might not be doing what I want it to do, but God is still good. And he's still on the throne. He's still in control. And he's still my heart and my portion and the strength of my heart. So I would say that's Mm. the time in my life that scripture really started taking root and and really was able to just cling to that. And it became a lifeline for me. Yeah, that's fascinating. I love how, uh, so was that a psalm or was that? Yeah, it's in Psalms. Yeah. I should look it up. I don't know then. I don't remember the number. If you give me just that's, a that's, second. Oh, that's okay. While well, you do that. Um, what I love about that is the idea of God being our portion. You know, there's that um, song. What is the song? How He Loves. You know that song, you, uh-huh. David Crowder? Yeah. And this idea, there's in there, the in the sort of the little bridge part, He is my portion, uh, or I forget how it goes, but the idea of us, of God being the thing that we get, right? So I think there's so many... Um, things that we want out of the world and things that we want from God in the end, he is what we get. He, he is the prize and we are what he wants. Mm. He says throughout scripture, um, I will be their God and they will be my people. That's his desired end goal for history throughout yeah. scripture. And him being our portion is just part of us experiencing that today that we'll, we'll get forever. Right. That's amazing. So you, you grabbed onto that truth as a way to kind of help you through um, the the anxiety. Did yeah, you find it there? Did you find the... Yeah. Um, so the scripture reference from that is Psalm 73, 26. Nice. But yeah, it's so true because like, I think that's where I just started realizing there's a big difference between like my life in Christ and who I actually am in Christ and the world that we see and experience. It's, it's two separate things. And if we can become more like who we are in Christ every day, that's where the real treasure is found. And, and even, you know, I'm fast forwarding 20 years to 2020, we're in a quarantine and many <laughs> people are feeling isolated and alone. And, you know, I'm just thinking like, it's the same today. God is still our portion today and he's always with us and he's doing so much good right now. I put up a post on Facebook the other day. It was just a question. And I said, what is something that's worked out well for you in the timing of all this? And I got to tell you, Eric, it just renewed my spirit because you, all of the comments that people listed, you could see God working. Like, even though you're looking out and it looks bleak and it looks dim, maybe it's like, you could see God working. You know, person was like, you know, I got kicked out of my photography studio and now last month. And now I realized that I would have had to pay the rent and I don't have the money to pay the rent or I got a raise last week or I got a job that works from home last week. Like just story after story after story of how God is working and we don't always see it with our eyes, Yeah, but we experience that with our heart that Mm. we can, we're still living out that same verse that he's still our portion. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so convinced. That's one reason we do the show the way we do as stories, people sharing their stories of experiences with God because I'm convinced that those actually boost our faith yeah. as much sometimes as scripture. Like I, I would never say this is on par with scripture, but I definitely think it's in the tradition of Luke sharing what happened to the early church in uh, Acts, right? It's, I it's sharing what, what happened because it reminds us that God is living. He's active. He's working in the world and we get to participate. I love that. And Jesus almost always spoke in stories. Yeah, he did. Like stories are so <laughs> powerful. 
Right. Amen. You know? Amen. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's good. What was it? So the anxiety you were, it sounds like you were really gripped with that. Mm. Did you, did that, was that a thing that uh, you eventually were able to overcome? Was it just the scripture? Was there? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Else? Yeah. So yeah, it was, I think it's a, a combination of a lot of things. I was under a lot of stress. I was a district. Um, I was the title one director for our district down in LA responsible for many, many, many students. <laughs> wow. And then also what had happened, and that was when the war with Iraq, I think started. And here's what I, what I felt, what I think really contributed to is like, I was reading every single article about the war, about the chemical weapons, mm. about this, that, and the other, because I was like, I want information. And I think what I was feeding my mind combined with the stress of my job. And then I had this, this moment where this started, um, was we were, it was like three o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden we hear this loud rumbling. We live by an airport, but not underneath the flight path. And I guess a, an airplane had gone off the flight path and basically buzzed our house. Oh, it was wow. stormy. So my husband runs to the window and he throws open the curtain. And I, all I see is like the number um, on the plane going oh, by. Man. And right then there was this huge lightning uh, it was in a lightning storm. So right then there was this huge oh. burst of lightning. Well, I'm so saturated in all this information about, you know, warfare and this, that, the other. Well, I thought we got bombed yeah, or something like all those factors kind of added it up. And it was like, really like the enemy can use like little things in our lives that would be seemingly insignificant, but it sometimes it just works with our mind to create these terrible things. And so that was my first panic attack. And I thought I was dying. I was laying in the middle of the bathroom floor mm. and saying to my husband, I don't want to die. You know, I don't want to die. And then I woke up the next day and I was like, why is everybody smiling? Like I couldn't wrap my head around it. It was like something just switched. And like I turned on the news and everybody was happy and stuff. And I was like, Wow, why are they still smiling? I'm still, I had BTSD, you know, right, I, thought, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to die. And anyway, so it was pretty severe and God used a lot of different things to help me through that. So he gave me a lot of tools like, you know, like breathing and like <laughs> normal tools that we would use. Um, I eventually did end up getting on medication, which helped me so much because um, I needed the medication to let my body calm down enough to get some healing and you know, there's all the chemicals involved with all of that stuff. And the medication actually gave me the opportunity to begin to heal. And so that helped me a lot. So a lot of Christians, I feel like sometimes are really down on medication. I'm like, if you need it, take it. If you need yeah, anti-anxiety right. medicine, take it. If you need antidepressant, take it. God uses doctors. He uses medicine to, to bring us healing. And then, of course, there was people praying and other things that happened in and he ended up healing me from it. And so like, I don't know, a year later, six months to a year later, after he healed me, I ended up going halfway around the world to Africa twice, two times. You know, I couldn't go out of my house six months ago, but now I went to Africa wow. and we were working on building some schools. And, and so, but I had to make a choice. There was a moment where I had to make a choice to really believe that. Do I really believe that God's healed me? Or am I still going to walk in this, you know? And, and I did make that choice. And um, it's not the same process for everyone, but I think we all have to go about our process of, of letting him heal us and, and taking it step by step and, and see what God is unfolding in our lives and trusting him with it. And so that doesn't mean that I never get tempted to have a panic attack anymore. I mean, I, it's tempting, especially when there's all information and scary, yeah. but I think what has grown in me is my trust in the Lord. Right. You know? So, yeah. Interesting. So the anxiety really taught you to trust the Lord. Yeah. Maybe in an extreme way. <laughs> it did. You know, it also taught me to trust other people um, oh, too, which is funny yeah. because I had to learn and I have a whole book about this on my website. I have a whole ebook about, it's called five ways to interrupt anxiety. Um, it's a very simple ebook, but it's just five tools. But one of the things I had to learn how to do was, to trust my husband or other people around me. Cause I knew like my thermometer was, my meter was off. Like I couldn't gauge, um, 
what was dangerous and what wasn't dangerous anymore. So what I had to learn how to be vulnerable enough to trust the people around me to tell me. So I would say to my husband, babe, um, there's a white van parked at the end of the block and I'm really worried about it. Are, are you worried about this white van? And he'd say, no. So I'd be like, okay, then I'm not worried about it either. Or like I could wake up in the middle of the night and I would say to him, can you breathe right now? Because I feel like I can't breathe. And he'd say, yeah, I can <laughs> breathe. So I'd say, okay, I can breathe too. And so I would learn how to do that and also learn how to trust the Lord in that and trusting that. I mean, we don't know when our last day is or, or whatever, but in all of that, learning that God is good and he knows everything and he's taking us through it and he's there with you every step of the way. Wow. Um, yeah, that's amazing. That is really, really powerful. I think um, I, I resonate with that a lot because I've, I've had some seasons of anxiety for sure. Not the same kind for sure, but yeah. Um, man, it can be so hard, so hard to get a grip on kind of what is really true. So those are really helpful. I'll put a link to oh. that uh, in the show notes for to the uh, five simple tools to interrupt anxiety. Uh, well, so what did you do to overcome your anxiety? You know, for me, it really uh, came down to one day, one night I was, I would wake up in the middle of the night and I, so this is when I was working at the bank. I was telling you I worked at the bank. Um, and I just, I have an MDiv. It took me nine years to get a three-year MDiv. And I felt like I had just wasted all that time because here I am working at the bank and not doing what I yeah. thought I was going to do. Yeah. And um, so I'd wake up and just feel like I would just overcome with this feeling of just hopeless, you know, sense of like wasting time. And um, I finally had this one night where I just prayed and I said, you know what, Lord, I don't know if this is what you want for me, I will go through it. I will trust you. Um, but I don't like it and I would like it to go away. And that was just a moment of surrender. And I felt just physically it kind of all just the stress kind of all drain out of my body. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've still had moments of anxiety since then. Certainly this whole thing, in the last, let's say, month or so, I've had a few where yeah. I'm like, oh, my gosh. And, and, but, I was, but now I can recognize it and go, oh, that's, I've been here before. I, that, I'm, I'm having a little panic attack. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can, now I can do something about it. But at the yeah. time, I just had no, I thought I was just going crazy. Well, um, that's the difference is like you can see, and that's what I talk about in my book. Like one of the ways I couldn't stop a panic attack is like, like, a while back I was in the grocery store and I started feeling like I was having a panic attack. Like everybody in the produce section is looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I called my husband and I said that out loud. I was like, I feel like I'm having a panic attack. Cause this, and I just started laughing. Cause I was like, that is so dumb, right, right. <laughs> you know, like, and I think you're right. It's just like recognizing it and then realizing like, you know, this doesn't have to overtake me. This is just something that I'm walking through right now. And God is here with me. I mean, that makes all the difference to just go like, okay, yeah, all right, cool. You know, right. instead of just trying to like think you're going crazy or think you're dying. Yeah, exactly. It does help a lot. And so, but I agree with you. If you need medication, if a doctor prescribes it to you, take it. It's, it's yeah. valuable. Um, I did that for a little while and it just made me sleepy. That was my problem. And oh, I yeah. I couldn't, like, I couldn't do anything. So, well, one funny thing that happened is I had to go to the psychologist too. And um, so I, after I'd come back from Africa, I had to follow up appointment with her. And, and she asked, how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing really good. You know, God's really healed me and gave me a lot of tools and this, that, the other. And, and I just got back from Africa. And she goes, well, now, see, she goes, I told you doing something good for somebody else is going to help you get off your medication. <laughs> right, <laughs> I right. I like, I think there's a lot more to it, you know? <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Whatever. It's, it's all that. I, I think whatever. podcasting has been one of the things, too, for me. Like, I, I feel like I've done something, you know, something yeah. good for people, so. Oh, my gosh, Eric, you've done so much good for people. Like, when I <laughs> hear people talking about you, okay, do not cut this part out of the I will. podcast. <laughs> No, it's about you. Hold on. But, you know, when I hear people talking even about Christian Podcasting Association um, or Podcasters Association, they are touched and encouraged. I mean, you're doing amazing things. So 
it's not just something. It's <laughs> amazing things. If you calculated the audiences of all the people that you're influencing and all of the people that they're speaking to, can you imagine? I mean, yeah. you won't know your total till you get to heaven. Yeah, oh, that's won't. that's sweet of you. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know. You know, sometimes we, we talk about Christian Podcasters Association on here. So if uh, if you're a Christian podcaster, you should join us. It's on Facebook. Just search Christian Podcasters Association. That's where we get together and uh, we help each other. So And I hear so many people say, oh, Eric told me this. Eric told me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. I, I was on it. Okay. We got to get back to your story. I was on, but I'll tell you this. I was on a show, um, Neil Matthews. It's called Other People's Shoes, which I thought was a really cool title for a show. And he started out and he was like, I think you're the godfather of podcasting. I was like, dude, no, it's <laughs> not true. <laughs> that is not me. I, uh, there are other people I would call that, but not, not me. Anyway, <laughs> but I do appreciate, again, we're, we talked earlier about the networking, right? I think that's just so fun. Um, one of the coolest things about podcasting. Anyway, yeah, okay, let's talk about I you because now I'm all embarrassed. All you guys. Yeah, like it's not, not about me. <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, that's, I, can, I can see him squirming in his chair right now. You guys, <laughs> oh, just to tell you, <laughs> it doesn't work with my yellow shirt. Anyway, the, uh, yeah. So, so you w went through that anxiety. You went to, mm -hmm. you went to Africa. It sounds like God, God really, really helped you there. Yeah. What, um, how did anxiety help you find yourself in some way? Or maybe it wasn't anxiety. Was there another way that you started to discover who you really were? Yeah. Yep. I'm just skipping like total, you know, decades of my story. Sure. Well, um, you can, we can fill, fill it in if you want to, but uh, you, you well, go ahead no, and answer okay. the question. No, 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 I'm fine. I think, I think there was a few moments that converged to help me sort of find out who I really was. One of them was when I turned 40 and it sounds funny, but when I turned 40, I had written a book in someone else's name I had my email address with someone else's name. I was doing other people's social media. I was using my voice for all these different things. And um, what would happen is that people who were doing social media with my voice, people would start telling them, oh, you're so encouraging or, oh, you're so happy or inspiring or whatever. And what I began to realize is that I have a gift. Like it took me till I was 40 to realize because you know, what's normal mm. to us is magic to other people. Yeah. And so to mm -hmm. me, it's not hard to encourage someone. That's like, that's my gift. That's what I do and who I am. But I didn't realize it until I was 40 and I'd used my voice for all these other things. And that's when I went, you know what? I have a distinct voice and I should be using it. And so in that moment, really, I decided, I, I thought, you know, I, and this is, again, talking about the preparation to where I am now. This was five years ago. I'm 45. Um, but in that moment, I thought, you know what? I wonder if I could go on social media and make an, put an encouraging comment in the world for 365 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. For every day for a year. And I started doing that. And I think that's where I really started discovering that this is, it's just part of who I am and it's, it's not hard and, and I can use my own voice and I can use it for the things that God is calling me to use it for in my own power and under my own. And you know what I mean? Not like I'm yeah. being selfish. I'm just saying like it's, it's distinct and different and God can use it in the way that he wants to. Yeah, he can. Well, see, I think that's so powerful, though. That's one of the that's part of the parts of the journey. So how did the previous however many decades or the, the few how did that prepare you for that moment? Hmm, that's a good question. I think in those decades, I was raising little children. Mm. And I think that sometimes you lose your voice in that. I was a stay at home mom and teaching from home and and all of that and homeschooling. And I think in those decades, I sort of lost my voice and, and just didn't realize that, that I had it. And I mean, I shouldn't say that because I led worship and stuff too, but I guess I didn't realize it as that it was distinct. I just felt like it was more like part of the crowd. But then doing all those things for other people, 
made me realize that I don't know if this I don't even know if this makes sense what I'm saying, but I think doing <laughs> doing good. all the things for other people made me realize that it was making an impact and that my voice was strong and, and clear and that it was I don't want to say magic because it's not magic, but it was something different than what the world is offering. And I think that's where I really started realizing, you know, social media is bad as it gets and as much criticism as it gets, you know, we as Christians can also be using our voices for the Lord and doing so many things. And I love meeting so many people that are doing incredible things mm-hmm. with their voices, you know? I love that too. I, I'm i convinced, obviously this time right now is a, is a good example, but I'm convinced if you just harness the tools, you learn how to use them, you can do yes. so much good. Don't... Oh. Don't disparage what, okay, yeah, I get it. Mark Zuckerberg controls the world. Okay. And, he, you know, it could do whatever he wants on Facebook. But if you just play by their rules, you can you can do so much good. You can bring so oh many people. Gosh. That's why I started a Facebook group to begin with, right? Because yes, because Facebook likes groups. So I said, oh, let's do that. So let's, let's figure yeah. it out, right? Well, and it's fun to see, too. So I'm a teacher and that's my trade and, you know, by personality. And so I, I have a class called Easy Podcasting Master Class. So what I did was I took like all my, you know, hundreds of hours, hundreds of dollars spent, and I made it down to the easiest way to podcasting, to, to podcast. And what I, I'm not doing that as a marketing thing, but I am telling yeah, you no, um, right. that I, so a gal that I met at spark who was crying and she was overwhelmed oh, no. by the process and she was lost in the process. She wanted to start a podcast. She has an incredible voice, but she didn't have the technical knowledge. And just today, this morning, I walked through the last class with her and she's already published her podcast in his recording episodes. And I was just saying to her, all you had to do was learn the tools. And now she has a, a if you listen to it, her, her podcast is called The Unstoppable Solo Mom. Oh, she I love has that. Wow. an incredible podcast for solo moms. And, you know, it was just that, just what you're saying. It's like she has all this wisdom and inspiration and content encouragement for a specific group of people. But it was just not having the tools that was holding her back from sharing that. And to come alongside someone and see them walk that out and learn the tools to put that out there is like, the most satisfying thing in the world because I just said to her this morning, you are doing this right now and it's incredible. And I think God is so proud of you for pushing past that barrier. So, Hey, if you're out there and you're listening to this podcast and there's something that you want to do, you have a call and a message on your heart, but you're thinking, I can't do it. I I'm not tech savvy savvy or I'm not tech savvy or whatever your, your hurdle is. Get the tools, go on YouTube, like Google's your best friend, figure it out. You are smart enough. You are infinitely smart as you want to be. And you can get the tools to share what it is that's on your heart. And you never know how it will impact people. Just go for it. Amen. Uh, In the information age, there is no excuse for not knowing something because that's right. I can almost guarantee YouTube has it or something. Somebody will share it with you probably for free. Yeah. Uh, nine times out of 10. And oh, yeah. uh, I always tell my kids, there's four words that I never, ever want to hear again. I don't know how. Right. <laughs> I'm like, right. do not do that to me. I know. Go on YouTube. <laughs> I stopped, uh, stopped even calling my dad when I need to do something around the house. Cause you know, he can't do anything. He's 600 miles away, but YouTube yeah. can show me everything almost. So it's, uh, right. right. And then sometimes you're like saving all this money. Like my husband has been doing car repairs and yeah. It was going to cost like $300 for this repair. And he looked it up and it was a little fuse that cost three bucks. There you go. Right. Uh, so much easier, crazy. right? Yeah. Um, absolutely. I was, pre- when I was preparing for Spark, one of the things I, I don't think I ended up saying this, but one of the things I kept thinking was that um, the in, information age, do you remember when, when they used to go around to your house or you would see commercials for Encyclopedia Britannica? <gasps> Oh my gosh. Do you remember that? Yes. Like cable? Like yes. they would send you one every month for $29 yes. or something? And that's because information was expensive. Like to get that, you had to get the books, you had to get them. And so it was nice to have them at your home or whatever. Yeah. Even though nobody ever read them, whatever. But 
Uh, and today it's just so ubiquitous. So I can get anything I want almost any time. I've got a shelf. I mean, you see the books behind me, but over here I've yes. got shelves and shelves of like Greek resources from when I studied Greek and Hebrew. None wow. of that. I don't need any of it now if I need it, <laughs> right? If I wanted to invest in something like Logos or whatever, I could, but it's just not, it's, it's, Crazy! It's absolutely crazy. What it's uh, insane, and our kids don't even understand that. No. Like the whole car, the whole card catalog thing at the library. They'll never get Remember? it. Remember? Yeah, yeah. So, but you. The point is, you can find it if you want to do it. You can find how, not knowing how is not an excuse yes. in the information age. So we're reach. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well, you, that's my one of my hot buttons. So we're. I feel like uh, <laughs> we're we're doing good. So. That's awesome that you're able to do that. What do you make of that transition in your life? Because that seems like it's pretty dramatic from not being able to leave your house to like helping people online oh. find their voice. Like God's really done something amazing with wow. you. Yeah. I never thought about it. Honestly, I never thought about what you just said. Like I'm tearing up because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's, that's amazing. Wow. I I guess what I would say, the what I think about it is that you just, you never know what God has in store for you. And that's why we have to trust him because his plans for you are so far and above what you would ever think or imagine. And we're so limited in our smallness of what we can do and what we think our abilities are. And, um, Wow. I guess that's why we just have to trust him because he has so much more for us than we think. I'm just, I'm kind of blown away by that question because oh, I good. never framed it like that. So you're getting like the real reaction. This is the real reaction. Awesome. I like that. <laughs> well, so that, those are my favorite moments. Um, I'm, that's great. Um, I, I just love what God's done in your life. I love, I, lo I feel like we've, we've really connected here. And so I appreciate you sharing bits of your story. I've got links to, Everything we talked about, including your website, Easy Podcasting Masterclass, which looks pretty awesome, um, and the anxiety, uh, overcoming anxiety, uh, the five steps. So uh, that's there as well. Julie, thank you so much for sharing your story. Is there anything you want to leave us with? Yeah, I think so. If I had one minute to speak to your listeners, here's what I would say is just go for it and believe that God is in you is enough. He's alive in you. He's a creative God. He is a multiplier. He is incredible and he's working in you and don't let your self doubt and your self criticism and your, the, the things that you feel are limitations. Don't let them hold you back from what God is calling you to because he has a, a wonderful and beautiful plan for your life. And it's so much bigger and so much better than you can even think or imagine. And when he meets, says that, he really does mean it. So let's just trust him. Oh, amen. That's it. He can <laughs> That's all be, I got. That's perfect. He can be trusted, my friends. Um, even when you have questions, he's not too big for them. So definitely, definitely go and check out more uh, about Julie from in the, in the show notes and her website. And uh, Julie, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. You've inspired me. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for having me too. I'm, I'm so, this has been a great conversation and you've really made me think as well. I'm like, okay, I got to think about some of those questions now. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me. 